Welcome to this talk about data warehouse schema design. In this talk, we'll go deep into the uh, dimensional modeling as it originally conceived by the Kimball group. Um, so if you ever heard about terms like dimension, facts, a star schema, and you wondered how it all comes around together, uh, this talk will clarify this. Um, so this talk is targeted at engineers who would like to construct a data warehouse and would like uh, an introduction about the terms and how uh, a data warehouse schema should look like. And for uh, analysts as well, who would like to understand how the data warehouse is constructed and what are the, um, the things that people take into consideration when constructing the schema design of dimensions, facts, etc. So who am I? My name is Nir David. I'm currently a senior engineer at Monday.com where I uh, build and model the new data warehouse for Monday. Uh, in my past, I've been CTO of two startups. You can follow me at, uh, at Nir D in uh, Twitter and uh, for all my content, I have my sites near the dev. I write a lot about programming, architecture. I have uh, a newsletter about remote work. So give it, a, give it a look. So let's start. Everything I'll talk about here um, is not an original idea, of course, um, but it derived from these books. These are the main uh, books for uh, data modeling and the uh, data warehouse design where the, the left one, the Data Warehouse Toolkit, is considered the, the Bible for Data Warehouse and uh, Data Modeling, uh, written by uh, Ralph Kimball itself who, uh, and the Kimball group. Um, another note about this book is that, uh, for example, in Shopify, they work with this book so closely, clo so closely that every data engineer in Shopify um, is required to read this book when he joins Shopify. Um, this is something we wrote in a, in a blog post recently. So um, if you want to expand on things I will say in this talk and go really deep and understand that where, where I was designed, I recommend uh, going through these books. Each have its own angle, but I re mostly recommend to start with the data warehouse toolkit. So let's start by talking about what types of database there are. So there is OLTP, Online Transaction Processing Database, that is what you know as the day-to-day -day operational uh, database for your application. That's where the day-to-day um, -day transactions of users in your applications uh, happens. And we have OLAP, the Online Analytical Processing, um, which is the database we want to create for the data warehouse, where we do online query and analysis of business entities. Um, and it's important, this is the part that it's online query and analysis. We are not talking about something but um, stands in some servers and uh, waits for some processing, some, for some offline processing. We're talking about online analytical processing. So the agenda for this talk. What, I'm going, what am I going to talk about? So first we will start by looking at uh, what a typical normalized database look like, the database you work in the, in the application. We will talk about the third normal form and it's important that we will talk about it in order to compare to um, the data warehouse design. Then we will talk about why do we need dimensional modeling? Why do we need what I'm going to talk about? What are the differences between OLAP and OLTP that requires this different design? After we, we talk about why we need it, we'll start by talking about the basic modeling terms. So we'll talk about what is dimension, what is fact, and then we will talk about how it all comes together in the star schema. Um, after we will have the bigger picture, we'll go into uh, bit more details about the what is grain, the dimension of grain, and what is surrogate keys. Um, and at this point, you will have enough uh, details, so we will go through an entire example. We will design something, and we will see how, how can we query it. And for the last part, we talk about slowly changing dimensions, but I feel it's a necessary thing to talk about. Um, of course, this is all just an introduction. Um, 
I go um, a bit deep in some things, but uh, all in all, if you would want to really design a data warehouse, there, there are a lot more things to learn. So this will give you just the, the background to, to start. Okay, so let's start by what is normalized database structure in the third normal form. I won't go into details about what is the normal forms, what is the second normal forms, etc. I assume you already know it, but just as a reminder, uh, the normal form is here to make sure we don't duplicate data uh, too much. Uh, we don't have, and such that we are normalizing the uh, the data across many tables. Um, so, for example, if we have an account table here for all our accounts, um, we will not have the plan data the right here. That we will have uh, a foreign key for another table, the plans table with the details here. Why? Because many accounts have the same plan. And if it is in the same table, we might, uh, when we have a, a change in a plan, we need to change it across all accounts and it's a duplication we want to avoid in the uh, application database usually. So let's talk about why dimensional modeling. What is the difference between OLAP and OLTP that calls for uh, for this different approach. So first, let's talk about data usage rates. So in OLTP, the, um, the da operational database uh, of your application, you usually read one thing at a time. It's optimized for inserts and updates. What does it mean? Usually when, uh, when an account uh, signs in to your application, you want to read the data for this account specifically. So it's reading one thing, one account. And in OLAP, we want to do aggregations and questioning of many things at a time. We want to optimize for every rate. So in the analytics uh, uh, part of our database, we don't want to read just one account. We usually want to read all the accounts and summarize or aggregate something about them. So we need to optimize for heavy reads instead of just one thing read and for reads instead of inserts and updates. Uh, history tracking. So in OLTP, in our uh, database for the application, we just need the current state. We want to present the user what his current state is, what happens, etc. And in the OLAP, we need history to track business progression over time. So for example, in uh, in our application, we want to uh, present the user with his current uh, cart, for example, and all of the products in the cart and the amounts. He doesn't want to know what necessarily what was there before the last uh, um, product was added to the account. But in OLAP, we want to know what are the progression of the uh, product added to the cart for some analysis. So this is another difference for the OLAP. Next, let's talk about data ordering and structure. So in OLTP, we want to optimize for application use and to make it logical to the developer. And in OLAP, we want to optimize it for the business structure and uh, to make it logical to the business people. So what does it mean? It means that uh, for some reasons, the application might need to access data in, uh, in a way that is not logical to the business people, but is logical to the developer uh, for performance reasons or for any reason but the, uh, the way the application is written. Um, let's say you have some weird microservice and this microservice need this data from that. So you have a weird structure and that's okay. This structure needs to serve the application, but the structure is not necessarily presenting the business structure as it needs to to be clear for the business people. So that needs to be kept in mind when we design different databases for different users. Data consistency. So in the OLTP, the data might be inconsistent uh, through some parts. What, what do I mean? So in the application side, you might have the uh, similar data, let's say, uh, being held in different parts of the database and this similar data is not necessarily uh, uh, the same. Uh, it might be uh, handled differently when presented to the user through the application code. 
uh, or anything like that. So in OLTP, it's okay to have inconsistencies like that. But in OLAP, the database is the last frontier for the analyst and for the uh, business people. So the data there must be consistent for the reports. You can't have two data points uh, presenting a, a similar thing, uh, but we have different numbers. It needs to be consistent. It needs to be clear that there is one and only one way to calculate something. Next, let's talk about structure for needs. So in the OLTP, in the application database, uh, the schema might fundamentally change from time to time. As the application changes, let's say you develop a new feature, you decide, you decide on some pivot on how you present data to the users or, or how users access data. Uh, the database is a server for the application, not for the analyst. So for performance reasons, for feature reasons, for any differences uh, made in the application, you might change the structure of the database and you might change it fundamentally. You might uh, uh, strip some fields from a table to another table. You might change table names. You might uh, uh, change entire table structure or entire schema structure, and that's okay. But in OLAP, the schema needs to be consistent. You are serving analysts and analysts are uh, looking on business processes and the business processes should be clear it doesn't depend on how the application uses the data it's a business process that should be uh, consistent and should not change over time because it needs to serve the uh, the analyst and their needs so with that done, let's go to the definitions, the basic definitions of uh, data warehouse terms. And we'll start by dimension. So what is a dimension? Think about dimension as by what we want to measure things, the who, what, when, where, etc. So some examples are dates, products, and countries. So for example, we want to measure um, the amount of purchases a user made. Okay, so we want to maybe measure it by how many purchases users made for uh, the product uh, MacBook. Okay, so this is by what I measure, by product. Or for example, countries. How many purchases users made from the USA or from Germany? So dimensions are things that I measure, measure other things by. Um, and this is the different from dimension table. So dimension table is the dimension, for example, product, or here we see customer, dates, etc. And um, these are the tables that hold the dimension data. So for example, let's look at the customer dimension. So we have uh, a primary key for the dimension. We have the name of the customer, uh, what country is from, city, age, etc. Um, let's look at the date. So we can see uh, date, we can see the date itself, year, month, day. So this is used um, further down the line to uh, measure things by this thing. So for example, let's look at date. I want to know how many purchases I had in the year 2020. So I might uh, uh, run a query where I ask, um, give me all the uh, purchases by date where year equals 2020. Now, there might be a lot of keys here with the year 2020 because I have month and day and every day, and it's okay. I will measure by all these keys. I might do where year equals 2020 and the month equals uh, August 8. So it will give me all the days in this month and I will see the aggregation of this date. Let's look at location. Uh, so location saves your country, state, city. So I might filter by the state or by the city. Um, another thing to mention here is that, as you see in customer, I might have the country of the customer, but I might have a dimension of location separated completely. And that's okay. When you decide how to design in details your warehouse, you need to make these decisions. Do I keep the location as a uh, as just a country within a customer dimension, or do I need to uh, separate it to its own dimension to uh, 
measure things by this separately. So these are some of the dimension, the decisions you will have to, to make when you create dimensions. Next, let's look at what is effect. Effect is an observation or event, something we want to measure. So some examples are customer payments, which is similar to the example I gave when we talked about dimensions, user logins, product orders, etc. So usually fact is something that is a number, not all the time. You might have facts that are text-based, but usually it's a number because it's something that changes very rapidly and you want to measure over time, over um, some other measures, as we mentioned in the dimensions. Um, so let's look, for example, at user logins. A user login is an event, but we want to uh, to measure against some other parameters. So let's say uh, we uh, make sense of it by referring to dimensions. So let's say we want to refer to the data dimension. I want to know how many user logins I had in 2020, how many user logins I had in um, Sunday uh, of some date. So I take the measurement and I, um, I make sense of it by comparing to a dimension. Okay? So let's take a look at the fact table because facts in and of themselves are just something to be measured, but they make sense in, in fact tables, they make sense because in fact table we marry some measures, some facts with dimensions, but we want to, um, to cut these measures by. So for example, in this uh, table, we see purchases fact, we have foreign keys of three dimensions, customer, product, and date, and the facts are price and amount. So for example, here I can look at, at price. In and of itself, it doesn't mean anything, but I can say, okay, I want the price, um, but people paid uh, for product MacBook in date in all of 2020. And let's say customer, I, I live Neil. So I will have a result that tells me the total price that people paid for MacBook in 2020. The same thing I can do with amount. And then I will have the amount of MacBooks people purchased in 2020. So the facts make sense by uh, regards to the dimensions in the fact table. And what dimensions are in the fact table are part of the uh, design decisions you will have to make. Um, another thing to note and to make sense here is uh, facts are things that change rapidly. So uh, the amount that uh, uh, users paid or the amount of that users purchased of some product is something that changes every day, every minute sometimes. And, um, and dimensions are things that are not changing that rapidly. So for example, a customer is registered. Let's go back. A customer is registered. The name, the name of the customer will not change daily, not even monthly, probably not even yearly. The country will not change very rapidly as well. It can change, and we'll talk about it later. It can change, but usually it won't. And this is another distinction to make sense of things. Okay. Let's talk about what is a star schema. So a star schema is the marriage of uh, a fact table with dimension tables. So as you can see here, I have a fact table and I have a dimensions of date, account, and platform, which are foreign keys going to each table, to each ID. And the facts it's are and the facts like active guests, active viewers. This is an example. Um, I took from the design I'm currently making for monday.com. So why does it call the star schema? So forgive my uh, limited ability to draw because this is uh, looked like a star. So think about it. The effect is in the center and you have these connections to other tables uh, and it looks like a star. So that's why we call it a star schema. Okay, next, let's talk about grain the grain of dimensions. So the grain determines what each fact row contains and in what details. 
The grain is defined by the dimension in the fact table and their details. So what does it mean? It means that uh, in a fact table, we have uh, uh, the dimensions and how detailed the dimensions are. And this determines how detailed the data we're storing in each fact table is. So let's look at an example for uh, dimension presence and there is also a, an example for dimension detail. So in dimension presence, let's say for analytics, we want to have the dimension of platform. So without the dimension of platform, I might, uh, let's say I only have the dimension of date the, and we measure visits. So I will know how many visits were in each day, but I will not know uh, uh, how many visits was in each platform, if that makes sense. So, so that means that, for example, if I only have the date I mentioned, I will know I had 200 visits yesterday. But if I have the platform they mentioned, I will be able to tell you I had 200 visits in total yesterday, but 100 visits were from uh, Android, 50 visits was from iOS, and another 50 was from a desktop. So adding this dimension changes the grain of the data. Another example, and let's go to the example of the uh, dimension detail. I have this platform dimension. Now let's say the platform dimension has only mobile or desktop. So in the example I gave, I will know I had 100 visits in mobile and 100 visits in desktop. But I can also have it more detailed, so separated, for example, for iOS, Android, BlackBerry, Windows, Mac, and each have its own details. So deciding on the grain is mostly uh, a decision uh, drive, driven by the business. What do I want to know? Usually, I would want to know as detailed as I want, as detailed as possible, but um, it's not always... Uh, uh, feasible technically. So we need to decide where we put our efforts in and how we define the grain. So let's look at another example of star schema. This star schema is a bit more complicated than the one we saw before. Before we had only the active users fact, now we also have the financials fact. And as you can see, the financials fact does not connect to the platform I mentioned because it doesn't make sense for us as a business to measure the financial fact by platform. So it does make sense to know how many new ARR we have uh, each day for each account or uh, the sum total in a month, the, the new, the churn, etc. But it doesn't make sense to cut it by platform because um, accounts are paying regardless of the platform and platform is only relevant for individual users and here we uh, measure accounts as complete account because individual user does not pay the account base so this changes the grain we collect data here compared to the active users fact now let's talk about surrogate key so the dimensions primary key should be in control of the OLAP system. What does it mean? It usually, it, uh, it's very tempting to use the primary key from the operational database, from the application database uh, in the dimensions. Because sometimes you have uh, a table that is very similar to a dimension table and you are very tempted to just take the primary key, the ID from the operational table and use it as the primary key in your dimensions. But this should be avoided um, for these reasons. So let's go one by one. Dimensions might change over time. To track changes, the same one represented in the operational system might have multiple rows. So what does it mean? Uh, remember when we talked about, uh, let's say um, here, this dimension of customer. So the country or the age of a customer might change and we might want to track the history of the country, changes of, of a customer through time. Uh, in the operational table, we will just change it in place, but in the, uh, in the data warehouse, we want to create a new row or something like that. We'll talk about it uh, later when we talk about slowly changing dimensions, but it will be diverged from the data in the operational table. 
So we can't have two rows of customers uh, with the same primary key. So we won't want to use the same, uh, the same key in the OLAP system. Next, dimensions may come from multiple sources. Synchronizing the primary key system is an unnecessary headache. So uh, sometimes dimension uh, might have data coming from one operational table and from other uh, data sources, and we don't have a synchronized primary key between them. Um, one example from real life I'm experiencing right now is accounts coming from our uh, operational table and accounts coming from the Salesforce system. So uh, those are not synchronized and there are no primary keys uh, synchroni synchronization between them. So if I would use a primary key from any of them, I will have to start building a system to synchronize them and not having them uh, override each other. And you don't want to go into that. And the last thing is just we want to decouple the OLTP system or systems from our OLAP system. So we need uh, the primary keys for our dimensions to be completely standalone and created by the OLAP system. Okay, so now we have enough details. Let's look at an example, uh, a real life example. We'll have some table and we'll see how, how can we query it. So what we are looking at right here is a financial spec table that have the dimensions of account, source, and date. And it measures the ARR of an account and the collection, um, which are terms, the financial terms in SaaS companies. ARR is a annual recurring revenue and collection is how much money we actually collected already. Um, so let's say I want to group by different user plans of an account uh, by different source dimension. So the source here is stand, standing for a marketing source. So it's, for example, this may be an account coming from Facebook ad, YouTube ad, uh, Google ad, something like that. So I want to group by the name of the source and I want to uh, filter by a specific month in a year. Uh, so I want to filter by May 2020 and the result table I will get from this uh, kind of grouping and uh, filtering looks like that. So I grouped by user plan and I have a user plan of 5 users, 10 users, 15 users, etc, etc. And for each user plan, um, I group by the source, the marketing source name. And I did a sum of the ARR. So I can see for a five user plan from Facebook ad, we got in May 500 a new ARR. Um, for 10 uh, users plan in Google ad, we got 550 ARR. So this is the end result. Let's look at how we can query it. This is what the query looks like. Uh, when you deal with uh, star schema, the queries become, in my opinion at least, very, very simple. So what we do is we select uh, each dimension we want to present. So we select the uh, user's plan and form accounts and the name from source. And we aggregate the uh, measure, the fact. So we sum from the financial fact, the ARR. And uh, we select from the dimensions, the date here, which we filter by, and the fact. And in the where, we put in the, uh, the filter, which is in the date filter. So we, where a date month is five for May, date year 2020. And we uh, match from the dimensions, the, uh, the keys in the fact, so for account, source, and date. And lastly, we group by the measures we want to group in the dimension. So it's users plans and name for the source name. So that's the result. Pretty simple. Okay. 
last one, last subject I want to talk about is slowly changing dimensions. So as I mentioned throughout this uh, lecture, dimensions might change over time. Um, I don't want to go into too much details here because this can be uh, a lecture in its own right. And uh, as you discover, as you go deep into things uh, about the, the dimensional modeling, you will discover a, a lot more subjects, subjects you can go deep in. But let's, let's talk about just a bit about the different types of strategies we can deal with uh, slowly changing dimensions. So type one is just override the data. Don't try, don't track history. So it makes sense for some dimensions, um, but are not important business entities, just not to track the history uh, and the way we change. If it changes in the operational table, just update the table you have and leave it as it is. The type two, which is the most used type, is that you add a new record to the dimension table and you mark the old one inactive with the inactivation date. So you have another column in the data, in the, in the table for dimension uh, that says um, which, when, when is the inactivation date and when uh, a new type of data for this dimension is ready, you put in the inactivation date there, you add the new data, data row, and that way you can track as many uh, changes to the dimension as you want. Uh, the last strategy, which is seldom used, uh, because it has many problems, is just to add a column in the dimension table for previous value. So when when a value changes, you just in the column of the previous value, you put the old value, you update the new value, and that's it. And there are a lot of issues with that. Of course, you can only track one change. What if you have one more than one change? Um, you might not know when the change happened, and then you, add, you need to add another column of last change and maybe multiple columns in the dimension might change so you need different column to each one and it becomes very complicated very fast uh, so usually you don't use it but there are some cases you might find that your business needs are very suitable to this so just so you know the option exists um, so that's it i hope this lecture and this talk was uh, very helpful for you I was very glad to, to make it and uh, don't forget to visit my site there.dev and uh, follow me on Twitter and let me know what you thought about the lecture. Thank you very much.